Welcome to the new show this week. I'm Dr. David Chow, Sports Injury Central podcast. Most of you know me as Pro Football Doc. But as you know, we're going to lots of different sports, bringing on other doctors. And and quite honestly, I've worked in Major League Baseball. I've worked in the NBA. Just don't have the same extensive experience. Heck, I've covered golf, WWE, rugby. I mean, uh, X Games. That's some of the stuff you see in the background here. So we're going to cover lots of different topics here. We are continue to experiment with some different formats here. And uh, I thought last week went pretty well with Justin, our producer, and Jacob. And this week we're having Taylor come on. And Taylor's been our number one content person through Pro Football Doc, uh, San Diego Union, Union Tribune, and now Sports Injury Central Analyst person. And uh, they're going to guide me through this a little bit and then call me out when I'm wrong and, uh, and chime in. So welcome to the show, Taylor, Justin. All right, thank you. That's it? That's all you got? Thank you? That's like, a, yeah, never, thanks, you're, thanks you're, for having you're, us. You're yeah. never that quiet, Taylor. I mean, cat no, got no. your tongue? I mean, Justin, <laughs> back me up on that. Have you ever heard Taylor answer a question with two words? Thank you. No, no, I'll admit he's probably a little shy right now, right? He's, he has, right. He's, he's being calculated. He's trying to tone it down a bit, but I think, I think we'll, get, we'll get the best out <laughs> I was of like, it. I was like, like uh, blink twice if you're, if, you, if you're not, if you're free, once <laughs> if you're a captive, Taylor. I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean that's oh, yeah. just not like you. All right, let's let's kick it off with spring training because spring is in the air. Yeah, I did take a spring training mini junket with my son. He's nine, and if you follow on Twitter, he sees stuff. He got a pretty good haul. He got a nice behind the scenes tour with the Padres, uh, and uh, you know, Josh. Thanks, Josh Stein and Scott Blumenthal, La Jolla Youth, Youth Baseball. Um, met Joe Musgrove. Got a signature from Joe Musgrove. I didn't meet Joe Musgrove. I was outside the the facility. We let the kids do the tour. Um, uh, We had some fun. He uh, got a nice autograph from Hugh Darvish. Hats off to Hugh Darvish. The guy barely, I think, speaks English. Was without a translator. After a very hot game where he pitched well as he's leaving, he literally signed for every kid. My son is a little... uh, Oh, I don't know, shy, and so he wasn't fighting for the autographs, but he just stayed there, and he came along and, and did everyone. So uh, kudos to you, Darvish, and you know, we had some fun. I, I ran into some other Padres personnel that I knew, and I didn't get kicked off the facilities, uh, or maybe they didn't see who see that I was there on the <laughs> practice grounds with all the Tatis stuff that we've talked about. But I, I talked to one guy off the record, guys, and, and, and he brought it up, and I won't say who. Uh, he's affiliated with the team, and and I said, and he says, oh, I see all your stuff related to Tatis, and and that he liked it. And, I, and my point was, I said, look, I hope you guys aren't mad at me. I mean, you, I'm just trying to tell the truth as I see it. I, I could be wrong, you know. And he goes, he goes, yeah, that's what we try and do. That's what I try and do. So, I think sometimes we're a little too sensitive. Like, there's more to the story on the inside. They pro- they obviously know it all, and. There isn't anything that we at Sports Injury Central are ever telling a team. They know the truth. It's not like they're making a mistake. There's just a reason why it got handled the way that it did. And uh, as we say, if we don't know the truth, it, it doesn't make sense from the outside. It's because we don't know all the factors. And that's probably the case here with Tatis. But Taylor and you and the boys have a lot of good spring training content up now and leading into the baseball season and uh, drafts, right? Fantasy drafts, dynasty drafts, etc. Why don't you highlight a little bit of what we have going on there and we'll chat. So we had a draft series um, that we've been helping people out with, just doing a, highlighting a lot of big players. The first one we had was highlighting um, a couple former MVPs, Bellinger and uh, Mookie Betts. Mookie Betts is a big one I would like you to talk about, um, MVP that we think might have a down year this year. And then we had another one about um, the World Series champions, Atlanta Braves, and a lot of their big injuries, including Acuna. So we've been doing a lot of big MLB content, not just football. So you can talk about a couple of those injuries. Yeah, well, go to sixscore.com. There's some videos, uh, Sports Injury Central. We're proud to have a Texas Rangers doctor helping us, other former team physicians. And one thing to watch out for, right, the roster is going to be 28. So mm-hmm. my guess is at least two of those extra spots are pitchers, right? And so who knows? You might, I mean, five innings is probably the max you could expect a pitcher to go right now. 
and pitches maybe too. Yeah. Yeah. So you got probably middle reliever one, middle reliever two, and the closer in 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 a game, and so pitch counts and and. Remember, uh, our guys, our doctors have said, you need a full six weeks to really get into pitching shape. And they don't have that right now. And so they're going to be understandably careful. And what we've seen in other sports when there's shortened preseason, it's more muscle injuries, more overuse injuries. So everyone's in the era of analytics, not just pitch counts, but you know they're monitoring velocity and arm angles and other things. If there's any sign of someone being tired, they're going to pull them and that may obviously may affect what you do in the in the wagering and or uh fantasy spaces but we're just trying to give you some injury analysis there so um like acuna coming off the acl we've done video and series on him he looks great he's an unbelievable athlete but he's not ronald acuna jr yet i mean he's not 100 percent the last time we saw him swinging uh, he's got a, he hits the ball hard. He's got a beautiful swing, but these were, uh, you know, uh, live pitches, but these weren't curveballs and changeups yet. There were times when he looked a little bit off balance as he finished the swing. I mean, he hit the ball hard, but, uh, he, you know, he's still favoring that right knee. He's not ready to go yet. Uh, not a hundred percent. And you know, the DH rule might help him, right? He doesn't need to go play the field. So that may, uh, uh, allow him to return earlier because the NL has DH now. So Acuna is going to get comfortable hitting earlier and running the bases earlier than he will be in the field, in the open field. And remember, that's how the ACL happened in the open field. So watch for Acuna's bat to return before he really goes in the field. Now, I don't know the Braves lineup and who's the regular DH and what they're going to do. A lot of different managerial decisions throughout of this, through all of this. And all we're trying to do at Sports Injury Central is give you an idea where the injury is, et cetera. You know, what a stress fracture to a ribs and a pitcher means. And as you mentioned, Mookie Betts. So I would go there for some of that spring training and uh, baseball content. Yeah, like Taylor said, uh, sixscore.com, part two just dropped. And if you want to follow us, you can follow us uh, on Twitter. You'll get all the updates right to your face. Uh, at sixscore, you can see us there. And obviously, at Pro Football Doc, you can follow Doc uh, on Twitter as well. Thanks, Justin. And so, probably the biggest news sporting event now, I mean, even though the NFL dominates the news cycle and all the trades, and we'll get to that, is the Final Four, right? Now we're here both the men's and women's Final Four. And, and unfortunately, we have significant injury content coming out of the uh, Elite Eight, right? And going in, we talked about Hakez uh, of UCLA not being 100%. And we put up a, Taylor, you'll have the stats. I mean, he kind of did what we thought. He, he played, which we never doubted, but we put a six score of 81 on him. And in the first half, he probably was 81 offensively defensively i think he was a little bit of a liability more and that's understandable in the second half it seemed like a lot of his shots were short and he fatigued it, what were his numbers again he had 10 points five rebounds and two assists but 80 percent of those points happened in the first half he was not scoring well in the first half his defense became there a lot of people were running by him on the baseline he he his a lot of his shorts were shot like you said he he wasn't the same player in the second half right he played so, 38 minutes though i mean he was out there a lot yeah. So a six score of 81, you could argue, was either accurate or for the second half a tiny bit high, right? I mean, uh, you, you, you know, not saying that, that, that he was the only reason UCLA didn't move on, but he certainly was one reason. I mean, and he's playing, but, but not 100%. And now going into the final four, uh, good job to the boys. I was on my way to spring training and uh, landed when, you know, all the video exploded and we only had about two seconds of video on, on, uh, on the guy, Justin, uh, uh Justin Moore, Moore of Mil yep. Villanova, number two scorer. But that to me was a clear Achilles tendon rupture and where the calf muscle overpowers it. And, you know, he even looks back like who hit him or kicked him and, Unfortunately, that's been confirmed. They didn't confirm it initially, but now it's been confirmed. So, you know, uh, you're talking about surgery. He's certainly out for the final four. If he 
you know, is he going to go back to school or turn pro? Either way, I don't know that he's ready for the start of the season. That'll be a decision um, for him to make. Um, but no Justin Moore in the in the Final Four. Uh, Villanova will have to take on Kansas without him. And that's huge for them because he's also, um, they run a very limited rotation. They probably use six, seven guys max. So he's their leading uh, point um, minutes getter. So it's going to hit them very hard. And on top of that, I mean, they don't have a replacement for him. They have a couple guards that maybe average 10 minutes or less each and two point, less than two points each. They are, they're going to have to run the hot hand and see what they have there. So it's going to be a very, very big loss for them. Yeah, the and, and I think it opened at minus three, uh, Kansas minus three, and FanDuel has it now minus four unless it's ticked or changed and uh, uh, we'll we'll see what happens with that but that that certainly is some big news and then heck uh, on the women's side some big news too UConn is in the final four but they're is it their number two player I mean it's not Paige Rucker she's back but they're forward um, it's one of their top players yeah freshman yeah a broker looked like it broke her wrist a distal radius so she is out unfortunately as well uh, so Old school, Duke, North Carolina. You know what's amazing to me? Okay, let's see if you can get this. You guys are more experts than I am. Who has dominated in March Madness head-to-head, North Carolina or Duke, head-to-head? Is this, a, March Madness? this feels like a trick question. They, I thought they never played <laughs> each other before. Exactly. All right. Oh, all right. no. <laughs> I mean, two story can't can't slide one over on you guys. You shouldn't miss it, Justin. You live in Carolina, okay? I mean, right, and, right, yeah. I mean, so uh, I found that amazing. Duke and North Carolina have never met. Yeah, I'll now, be honest with you. I, I live here, and yeah, I, I I just learned that along with you. I, I assumed that the rivalry had had spanned into March Madness before, and the fact that it hasn't, it's pretty crazy. Well, it makes some sense, right? They were all number one seeds on different sides of the bracket, and maybe they never right. met into the finals, you know, but kind of thing. But I think it's amazing. They've never met Duke and North Carolina. And so we'll see. Uh, Coach K, last hurrah. You know, we'll, we'll see what it's, happens. Yeah, the storylines pretty much write themselves. It's pretty crazy that it's Coach K's last season and he's going to get to get that la- one last hit in the rivalry in uh, in March Madness. But I, I will say, leading into that game with St. Peter's and UNC, I was like, to me, it was kind of like a win-win. Ideally, I know that it, this, the, the, for headlines purposes, Duke UNC is incredible. But I was I was kind of excited either way. Whether if St. Peter's pulled it off and made it to the Final Four, that's I mean, to me, just as crazy of a story. No, I mean. Uh, St. Peter's versus Coach K? I mean, that's amazing, yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, but, you know, that's the thing about March Madness. The storyline's right itself. And, and, and one thing that we do always try and do at Sports Injury Central, never too high, never too low. Let's not overreact on things. Let's, let's be measured. And, look, the storyline going in is, is going in before the Final Four was – Look at all the upsets. We could have a 15th seed, an 8th seed, a 10th seed, all in the Final Four. And what do we have? We have a 1, 2, 2, and, and uh, wait, what is it? A 1, 2, 2. Is UNC's 8. And, and an yeah. 8. UNC's and eight. UNC's an 8. 1, 8. But it's a blue blood, right? So right. we have four blue blood teams in there. And, you know, but the headlines coming in, it was all these upsets, and Baylor's out, and everyone's out, Kentucky's out, and all these underdogs and whatever. But we have a one seed, two two seeds, and number eight North Carolina. That's not, you know, uh, shocking to anybody. It's it's kind of uh, old school, but yeah, you know what's what... wild is obviously a lot of people filled out their brackets, uh, myself included. It got broken very early. Uh, I know we had a little contest here internally, and it was just like everybody's bracket was done right after the first weekend. It was like pretty much a wrap. But this Final Four, like you said, these are big. These are big schools. I saw a stat that said only like 0.27% of the brackets filled out had this final four. And I found that shocking that, I mean, I know, I know UNC had a, had a pretty down year. They were eighth seed, but to not have that, not even a 1% of the people who filled out bracket. Well, I guess that is a lot of people, but 0.27% well, for well, these final do four. Do the math, man. I mean, permutations and combinations. I mean, 1% would be a lot to have that final four combination. Look, I, I'll admit something that you guys know. I went in San Diego, went to that, uh, uh, first uh, round, well, s- technically, I guess second round, right? Uh, set of, uh, set of games over at uh, Viejas Arena where San Diego State plays. I got last-minute tickets, 
And my son didn't even want to go. He plays some basketball. He's nine. He's been watching some Final Four, you know, March Madness at home. He didn't want to go. You want to know why? When he filled out his bracket, he picked Tennessee to go a long way. Oh. And I did too. Yeah, me too. Tennessee (laughs) out. And he's like, why do I want to go? My bracket's busted. And I'm like, that's all he cared about. Yeah. I mean, you did a self bracket with me. You're not even competing for anything, not even for a piece of candy, much less any money. Yet you've lost interest in the in March Madness because your bracket is busted. And I said, "No, we're going to the game. I got these tickets. <laughs> You're going." And uh, and he goes, "Can we stay only for one game?" You know, he oh was like, goodness. "I was like, oh gosh." And so as we're driving there, he goes, "Yeah, bracket's busted." He goes, "Dad, uh, I don't know that I really wanted Tennessee. Can I switch?" Kansas. <laughs> and I was like, sure, you could yeah. switch Kansas, right? No problem. And then as we were there, he was like, who did I have my bracket? Uh, and it was Arizona and, uh, and, uh, oh, and then uh, Texas Tech is who he had in his bracket over Notre Dame, right? And now he was interested again. Yeah, he was happy. He was <laughs> and, and by coincidence, he had a red shirt on. So perfect Texas Tech in Arizona. And he stayed and cheered for those two teams. And what that tells you and what it tells everyone, and it's what I've been saying to all of you guys, when you are personally vested, it becomes interesting. And it used to be we were all personally vested because, like my buddy who I just visited in spring training, he's a lifelong Jets fan, no matter what. Because when he was like, I don't know, five or six or something, he met and got a picture with Joe Namath. And he is forever a a Jets fan. So he's vested the Jets through... uh, Joe Namath, you can argue, caused him a lot of misery. Yeah, oh yeah. And my buddy, you know who you are. I hope you're you're listening and watching this and you'll get a a chuckle out of the mention here. But Brent, you know you're out there. But anyways, he's vested always in the Jets because of that. And we used to be vested in San Diego just in the Chargers or in a certain team. But fantasy has us vested all over the league, right? Of, oh, Devontae Adams or Derek Carr or whoever, Leonard Fournette, Tom Brady, has us vested beyond fandom and with a lot of different teams. Good and choice. I think that's responsible for viewership. And, and daily fantasy has us vested. But imagine his legalization of gambling throughout the state. No one's suggesting you're betting a rent check. But we all know when you go golfing and uh, if there's no give me putts and that two foot putt is now worth $2 or yeah. a beer, it becomes a knee knocker, right? And there's a lot of excitement when you make that two foot putt and a lot of misery when you miss it from grief and otherwise. And, and that's kind of what my son reinforced that like when you're personally vested, that's where it matters. And that's where what we're trying to do is help people get personally vested on the right side of what's going on and, and have more interest. And look, I'm in California. I don't gamble. But I was paying attention to the UCLA game to see, well, what were our thoughts on Jaime Jaquez Jr.? Where do they really sit, right? And so that's also another form of personal vesting. And that's kind of what, what we do here. All right, so that's Final Four. NBA, we got lots of NBA topics going on. Look, uh, we said Anthony Davis four weeks was way too soon. Now he's closer to six, and he's getting closer. He might make it for the playoffs, but, right, the Lakers don't have a long road maybe in the playoffs. (laughs) It's not like the Celtics center where the Celtics might go a long way, so he's got a good chance to come back even with a knee scope, and we've written about that. And I – look – uh, I, I know podcasts are mostly audio, but go look at that Zion Dunk video, guys, or yeah. for the video guys, Justin will show it here. Take a look at Zion's feet. Okay, so we've said since December, Zion's not coming back. And we were way ahead on that. And he hasn't yet now. And then Sham Charnia said he's not coming back recently, last week. And the next day, Zion puts out this video of him dunking. And there's news that he's okay for one-on-ones. Well, one-on-ones is not five-on-five. And when he was dunking there, uh, and this is not a comment on his weight, but the floor was bending. Go look at his feet. 
That's a rehab floor. That's not a regular hardwood floor. I mean, you can't dent the hardwood like that. I don't care how much Zion weighs. But I think it's just funny that, okay, he can dunk, but he's still got a soft landing and soft takeoff on that rehab floor. Uh, we still don't think he's going to be ready. I think it's good news if he avoids a second surgery. We've, we've talked about that. So uh, lots of different uh, NBA content here. Yeah, Doc, I want to ask you something real quick on that. Uh, that video, was that a calculated release by Zion? I mean, I know there's, there's been talks that there's, like, disdain between – not th their, their relationship between the Pelicans and Zion is, is in flux, right? No one really knows where they stand with each other. But the, the, the timing of that right. video being released is what kind of caused the stir. I'm, you know, the floor aside, the fact that he can still dunk like that right now after, after people wrote him off. I mean, he, it seemed like it's just oh, crazy to see that. Look, Zion ducking, this is what I get a kick out of all the time. The general public, look, I'm lucky enough to have seen firsthand how unbelievably amazing these guys are, even when injured. The fact that Zion could do that dunk is relatively meaningless to me. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't mean that he's ready to go, even if it were on a regular floor, okay? I mean, the stresses over time and of the game and playing defense and the minutes, I'm not even talking about his weight and in shape. So I look at that, and I'm very impressed at what he does. But that doesn't mean he's NBA basketball ready. I mean, the NBA guys are not one percenters. They're, they're, not, they're not, in a financial sense, the billionaires of the world. They're the trillionaires of the world. Like, there's just so few of them. They're not certainly not the millionaires of the world in a relative sense. Their talent... I mean, it, it's just off the charts, you know, and that's where I look at videos all the time. Look, let's, and it, I don't know. I just don't think he's, he's that close at this point in time, especially okay. NBA. Now, could he go and do some minutes here and there? Uh, maybe. But look, uh, NFL, let's transition to NFL. Jeff Okuda video of his Achilles. He's moving great. He's covering guys and doing stuff one-on-one. -on -one. But I would argue that uh, when he does some, uh, some uh, different drills, he preferentially uses the healthy side, not the Achilles side. He's almost 200 days. He's doing very well. He's on track. He looks fantastic. There's no way uh, any of us could ever get open against him in our wildest dreams, uh, uh, much less you know, uh, 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 any high school player, any college player would get open against him. But this is the NFL, and, and also, believe it or not, um, you know, breaking on the ball is what's the biggest thing. And we don't see a lot of that in the video. He's running with guys. So he's get coming along, Jeff Okuda, but even he is not 100%. Um, lots of NFL news out there. We don't, we, you know, we're, what about the quarterbacks, Doc? We can talk about Jimmy G and Mariota and Watson. Let's go through, I mean, through that. You know, I found it interesting. Uh, let's talk about Deshaun and, and you know, his legal stuff we're not getting into. We've opined a long time ago that it certainly is unusual to have 22 different masseuses in your hometown of Houston. It's one thing if you're traveling around and, and what have you. And who knows how many he totally had. Uh, certainly, you know, for a pro athlete, and you can ask any of them, when they find a good masseuse, they stick with them. Now, they're not always available. They timing, so maybe you've got two, maybe you've got three, maybe you've got eight. 22 seems like a lot. That's all I'm saying. Now, is he guilty or not? Look, two grand juries have decided not to charge him, right? So it is what it is. But here's my question to you guys. And, and forgive me if I don't have the numbers right. Everyone says that Jacksonville went on a huge spending spree. And they did dole out some contracts. They passed out early in free agency a hundred about one hundred seventy two hundred seventy five million dollars in guaranteed contracts. The Browns handed out two hundred and thirty million dollars of guaranteed contracts to one player and traded people. Um, you know, I don't know which one's going to work out better. Maybe the Browns, right? And who knows how long he's going to be suspended? They may have factored it in, but. In terms of risk-reward, 
who's more all in? The Browns with 230 million guaranteed and giving up these draft picks? Or Jacksonville spending 175 million on a handful of different players? Yeah, you could argue it either way, right? I mean, Jacksonville's happy with what they did, and the Browns are happy with what they did, right? It's like uh, after a surgery, oh, it's successful. Well, you can't judge success the day after surgery. You have to judge it when they're back, right? You can't judge a signing or a draft pick in a day, a month, or even a year. You got to long term take a look at it, or signings, and decide decide what it is. But the other thing that finally came to roost today is. I guess it's not a shocker, but, you know, a team's trying to do its job, right? The 49ers are saying, nothing to see here, Jimmy G shoulder surgery, nothing to see here, no big deal. Well, we said, wait a minute, it's his throwing shoulder. We said during the playoffs we were worried about his cuff, and we said it's going to inhibit his trade ability. Well, at the NFL meetings, Kyle Shanahan admitted, yeah, the, the, the surgery has delayed or, you know, affected trade talks. And now there's talk of they may have to hang on to Jimmy G because there's no other takers because they don't want to cut him. What that means is TBD. Like, who knows what happens going forward? Who knows what happens after the draft? Does Carolina get someone? Does Atlanta get somebody? Does who knows a landing spot? Is there an injury in training camp and now Jimmy G gets shipped off somewhere? Who knows? It just means that the 49ers are admitting that Jimmy G is not tradable right now but come july or maybe august because he may become tradable again so for anyone to ask kyle shanahan if they're both on the squad who's starting uh first of all they're still not both guaranteed to be on the squad one is trey lance is but to be determined and that's kind of uh what we do a little bit here all right let's move on to our beast of the week here and uh, we're going to jointly decide this one. But I have to give a shout-out, runner-up Beast of the Week, to uh, Big E. He's a WWE wrestler. Uh, maybe I'm biased because I've worked some WWE wrestling before. Look, this, the, uh, everything is scripted, but the injuries are real. I mean, these guys, the way they're acrobats. I mean, Big E, if you've seen the video... Landed straight on his head, axial load. I didn't like it. At the time, we wrote, he's lucky, not trying to sound morbid, to be alive. Because a C1 fracture often kills people if it's displaced. And his was not displaced. Maybe because he had a C6 fracture at the same time. So the pressure got relieved at C6 a little bit. And he tweeted out that he saw his doctor follow up and he was told that he was lucky to be alive. That a lot of things could have happened. And so uh, to, for him to maintain his good attitude and everything, best of luck to him. He's a beast for what he's done in wrestling. I mean, this happened on nationwide Fox national TV, WWE SmackDown. Uh, amazing. Glad he's okay. Look, is his regular wrestling career over? No question. But can they script different things and have them still be doing something? I think they can. But they cannot take risks with that C1 fracture. A lot of times when it heals, it heals with what we call a fibrous union, not as secure. If there is a half a percent chance something really bad could happen, you cannot let that guy do regular full rest, uh, wrestling moves. His days of a suplex are gone. Can't do it. Can't risk it. But he's got to be... a uh, runner-up beast of the week at least but for the beast of the week i'll throw it out to everyone to you guys out there i want to pick a beast of the week <laughs> out of the coaches photo the annual coaches photo in florida and everyone wears what they want and uh we'll open it up to you guys but we'll kind of go through uh one at a time here, all the different guys on one run through here. First of all, left to right, first row in the audio, you, you just got to look at the picture. John Harbaugh, a little frumpled, but that's nothing really. That's just John Harbaugh. He's been there forever. Matt Rule, I think you guys are saying he got a little, a little boxy pull he, he got on there. <laughs> yeah, he got he got a roasting after this picture was posted on on Twitter. He probably I I don't want to say he got the worst of it. I mean, because other people, you know, obviously they're wearing different outfits, but it just looked like Matt Rule threw on what he found on his floor and and he went to you know like he just There's came no to this wrinkle, meeting. Right on the floor is definitely <laughs> yeah yeah but yeah. but look uh, uh, 
Matt Rule's living the good life as a head coach, right? I mean, yeah, no, I don't, I don't blame him Andy, at all. I, I don't know that he's Andy <laughs> Reid yet, but boy, hey, yeah. he's he's uh he's getting up there. Nathan will hack it pretty routine. Um, Dennis Allen, who picked out his belt? <laughs> he looks like he's about to teach me chemistry in ninth grade, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Sean Mc, McVay, too cool for school. Um, only guy with a sport coat on. Sean McDermott. I guess he traded his his uh, baseball cap for a sport coat. Huh? <laughs> That's why I didn't recognize him, I mean, to be honest. Yeah. And uh, Josh McDaniel's halfway to, to being Raiders coach. He's wearing black, but the pants aren't black. So, you know. <laughs> He's almost there. <laughs> He's almost there. Uh, Mike McDonald. McDaniels. First of all, I, I don't really know the guy, but look. If you put him in a lineup and say which guy's an NFL head coach, he's the guy who <laughs> no one says is an NFL head he's coach. He's the IT right? tech I mean, guy, right? He's the, <laughs> he helped, he's helped. Yeah, I mean, uh, but he's perfect for Miami. He's got that linen shirt and he's got that wife beater on underneath. Uh, I mean, yeah, but he doesn't look the part of a football coach, but which probably will make him a, a great one. Um, going next row, I'm a little disappointed in Nick Sirianni in that photo. I mean, I wanted to see what's on his T-shirt. Anyone know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I got no idea. It just looks like he's got some color there, but I don't know it's what's like going on. Black and gray hat kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, I'm not. I don't know. I mean, usually he's got some good T-shirts. I mean, that's <laughs> what he wears. Um, Arthur Smith next to his boy Mike Rabel. He looks distracted. Arthur Smith is a bigger boy than I thought. <laughs> Rabel's a stud. I love him. Salah's there. I didn't realize that. It, I mean. Is, is he got platform shoes on, or is he really that tall? Oh no, they're they're on a, they're on a curb. They're on the second row. Yeah, they're up a step. Yeah, yeah. Shanahan is nowhere. I know, but look at him next to 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 Salah Rabel. I mean, is he in, is he on the third row there? Yeah, there's Maybe. there's a top one. There's a step in the middle, not used, and then there's a. Oh, yeah. and then Tomlin's just hiding out because okay, I was like Kyle Shanahan can't be that much taller. No, than no, he he probably was hidden behind. You know, they were like he's so short. They're oh, like, he's on you the third step. step. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and then there's okay, so. <laughs> So he did the, uh, instead of doing tippy toes, I mean, there's room for him on the second step. He could have come down there, but he decided to go up on the third can step. Can you see me with the pink polo? Uh, That's what he's saying. He can see it. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I, right? I mean, there's plenty of room next to Sala and Rivera for him to be on the second. I got fooled there. Then then uh, my guy Ron, and then uh, LaFleur, Zach Taylor, Lovey. Interesting. And back row, chime in any time there. Back, back row. I mean, Kevin O'Connell, the San Diego State kid, uh, stands out. Of course, yes, the bull. Shade, too cool for school, Cliff Kingsbury. Tomlin's hidden. Yes. Uh, he, right. looks like Tom, it looks like Patterson. Tomlin's wearing a sport coat. He might be He might be repping one, too, but he, he's so far in oh, the yeah. back there. Oh, yeah, Tomlin's hiding the sport coat. Yeah, I, I expect nothing less, man. He's, he's, he's got the glasses he looks on. Angry. He's, he's, he looks angry. He, he looks angry. He should be up there with McVeigh. I mean, they, they're probably the best dressed yeah. right now. In that oh, there's room. room. <laughs> there is room. There's a huge space. He just looks like he doesn't like yeah. McDermott. McDermott looks like he's contagious right now. <laughs> There's a huge All right. Face. So, so uh, Taylor, Justin, who's your beast of the week? Who's who's the best or worst dressed or most significant? Who would you call out here if you could point out one guy and why? That's tough. I mean, I I know I know McVeigh's getting a lot of crap for his little frat boy look, but I mean, I, I mean, he just came off the Super Bowl win. He I, I kind of like that he's just showing up like that. You know, he's just kind of he just he's giving off the vibe of yeah, I'm the dude who's got the ring, right? I got it this year. I, I kind of like that. <laughs> Rules confidence is amazing because, like you said, that is something you, that might be the ninth option of an outfit he had that morning. You know, so <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm happy for that. You, you're, you're assuming he looked in a mirror. He didn't look yeah. in a mirror. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're right. All right, so you go yeah. rule. You go McVeigh. I mean, I got to give a runner up to Ma Mike McDonald. I mean, I mean, he's gonna just do his thing, not worry about it, right? And. uh a sneaky one is Kyle Shanahan sneaking up on the top step when he, <laughs> there's room down below, right? I'll say one I thing. Mean, I will yeah. give I'll give props to Ron Rivera though because it, while I, at first glance it looks like he's just wearing a tropical shirt, that's branded. That's oh, a, no, that's, that's a Washington that's Commanders branded shirt. Tropical. It's fantastic. Uh, uh, that's my beast of the <laughs> week here in this one. I'm going to give it to Ron Rivera. He's front and center. That tropical shirt is all out there. He's stealing Andy Reid's thunder. You can't even see Andy Reid's tropical shirt. <laughs> he's got the shades on. He's a he's a cancer survivor. He's survived all sorts of grief in Washington. 
Uh, he's a play. He's the man. I got to give my guy Ron the the beast fo- in that photo there more so than even. Well, McDaniel Sean didn't want to accept the award because uh, you called his name wrong. You said McDonald, uh, so he didn't want to accept the award anyways. It's good that you switched oh, it. Oh, okay. Uh, whatever, <laughs> uh, McDaniel. And then and then and then and then look. The other yeah. extra credit is maybe maybe he maybe he moved uh, Mike Tomlin to the back row so that you could see his uh, whole tropical uh, Aloha shirt attire. Ron Rivera. Great. Uh, Doc, before we get out, there was breaking news while we were recording the podcast, and I just want to throw it out here, and we'll get, probably get into it a little more extensively next week. But Albert Breer on Twitter just tweeted, sources that the NFL owners have passed the Indy slash Philly overtime proposal allowing for both teams to have a possession in the playoffs only in overtime. So both teams will now get possession. I don't know how that's going to work out. Maybe next week we'll have all the details. But that just got passed at, as we were recording. Look, I think it's needed. I mean, no offense, but you you play quote sixty minutes, you know, of stop time, run time football, and then overtime, like it's really that big a deal to say ten minutes versus fifteen minutes, right? Right. right. I mean, uh, especially in playoffs, right? So it does make some sense. Yeah, more plays is more injuries, but don't you want to get a good conclusion, especially in the playoffs, right? Yeah. Uh, kind of situation and let everyone have a chance and and if you have to play a few more minutes so be it right let's let's before we get hokey and start deciding it with you know from uh by exchanging two-point plays and whatever let's let's keep it to the game that we all love so i don't mind that i mean uh and the injury risk will be so small with it with it just being the overtime games uh i think that'll be uh interesting it might change a little bit of strategy you no longer want the ball want the ball first right. now for sure. Yeah, and you won't be dogging you it, right? You'll be you'll for be for sure. Because yeah. number one, you know what you have to get. Number two, you now have four downs to get it. Because if you have the ball first and it's third right. and ten, you're punting. If you have the ball second and it's third and ten, the other team scored, you're going for it. Yeah. That's a big you know right. so the you watch, the advantage will flip to the person who gets the ball second instead of first. That's a good, yeah, that's a good thought. And then 10 years, years <laughs> we'll have another rule change because people will. Yeah, yeah. They'll, they'll that's, just, what makes, <laughs> that's what makes the world go around. All right, thank you, Taylor. Thank you, Justin. Yes, uh, Pro Football Doc, a Sports Injury Central podcast. Thanks for listening. And uh, appreciate all the good ratings on uh, iTunes and all that good stuff, Apple and whatever. And uh, if you have any suggestions, go to Twitter and uh, tweet at me any suggestions for the podcast. Appreciate you all. Thank you.